Hi, welcome back to The Basement. I'm Steve Lewis. Today's episode is the type I really like to do, and this one's a little overdue. It's been about 12 episodes since we went back over some of the comments that have come in, some of the great information that you guys have provided on the various episodes. The comments recently have been terrific, plentiful, really interesting. Some of them have been absolutely hilarious, and I really enjoyed particularly people's reminiscences about 1985. We won't be able to get to everything, but I did want to hit some of the high points over recent episodes. Starting with episode 63, the last time we recapped, we talked about the Custom Kings album. And Goran T. from the Surf and Hot Rod YouTube channel followed up with me regarding the Custom Kings and sent me some photos of the Custom Kings at work in the studio. Though the album was created by a group of L.A. session musicians led by Steve Saxophone Douglas and featuring Bruce Johnston, apparently there was a group put together for promotion and presumably for live appearances. I had assumed that custom car king George Barris just provided the car pictures and descriptions for the album cover and allowed his name to be associated with the album in exchange for the publicity that it would bring. From the photos, it appears he was a little more involved, at least to the point of posing with the group for photos. Goran also sent a photo of a press release regarding the album on Barris Custom City letterhead. Really interesting stuff, and thanks again, Goran, for allowing me to share it here. If you haven't checked out Goran's The Surf and Hot Rod Scene YouTube channel, please do. He's got some really, really interesting stuff on that channel. Thanks again. The next episode, The Tammy Show Part 1, I said I thought that Marvin Gaye's tuxedo looked really out of place and to my mind didn't fit in with the sort of R&B career that he had. I wondered why Motown had chosen to have him dress that way. Viewer Richard Harris tells me that Marvin's original plan was to be presented more as a jazz pop crooner and cajoled Motown into letting him record standards in addition to the kind of R&B he was best known for, though a lot of those standards remained unreleased in his lifetime. Richard conjectures that it's likely the tuxedo reflected his interest and was probably Marvin's choice. Given that background, it certainly seems like a reasonable hypothesis, and thanks, Richard, for that information. On the next episode, The Tammy Show Part 2, Glenn R. reminded me that DJ Lee has a beautiful version of The Tammy Show, which is colorized and in true stereo. If you don't know DJ Lee's channel, you really are missing out. He spells his YouTube name DJ space L33. He pronounces it DJ Lee. In addition to his great YouTube channel, he's got an online radio station that showcases the Beach Boys. He's a great guy, has a great eye and ear for detail, and is amazingly prolific. I don't know how he manages to create all the content he does, but it's some great stuff, so please check it out. And Glenn, thank you for the reminder on that. In episode 66, the Beach Boys album covers part 9, I asked if there were any album covers that anybody could think of prior to the Beach Boys Light album that featured separate illustrations for each one of the songs, apart from the two I could think of, which were Goodbye Yellow Brick Road and the Ringo album. Viewer The Noble Surfer pointed out King Crimson's Lizard album cover. Tony Balls came up with Cheap Thrills. Justin Ainsworth came up with Shaved Fish. And both Justin and Tony came up with Rocket to Russia, with its illustrations on the inner sleeve. Also, Joel Goldenberg reminded me that the Smile booklet was meant to have illustrations for some of the songs. Post-1979, Andrew Capobianco came up with Black Sabbath's Live Evil, and Tony Balls came up with Under the Big Black Sun by X, Our Beloved Revolutionary Sweetheart by Camper Van Beethoven, and None Such by XTC. In the next episode about the Blondie Chaplin album, I complained that I found several release dates for that album ranging between February and September of 1977. Willie at Minix Music conjectured that they might possibly be release dates for the U.S., the U.K., and South Africa. I haven't been able to prove that out, but that certainly seems like a reasonable theory. Thanks for that, Willie. Additionally, I'm still trying to find information on Blondie's 2001 album, Fragile Thread, which I heard about online, and sources there say it's unreleased but in circulation. I know some viewers, like our old friend Tony Balls, tried researching this online and basically came up with the same information that I did. I would still love to know more about Blondie Chaplin's Fragile Thread album. If anybody ever runs across anything, 
please let me know. Damien McMurray did let me know about a 1987 album that Blondie Chaplin was heavily involved in called Picaresque by Japanese bassist Ray Ohara. I managed to score a copy of it, and I'll be talking about this in depth next week along with Blondie Chaplin's second solo album, Between Us. Thanks very much for the tip on this, Damien. I really enjoyed it. In the comments section on episode 68, Justin Ainsworth and I were corresponding about the Wild Honey album cover. I had talked about the cover in some detail in an earlier episode. We both love this cover and also its groovy graphics. Viewer Coffee Table Vinyl added that this is a photo of the stained glass window from Brian Wilson's house. Now, I had always heard that it was artwork based upon the stained glass window in Brian Wilson's house. Looking at it more closely, I think Coffee Table Vinyl is probably right. This really looks more to me as I examine it like a photo of a stained glass window than it does artwork based on a stained glass window. If anybody has any insight into this, please let me know. Incidentally, I really wish somebody would make a small sort of album cover size reproduction stained glass window of this and offer it for sale sometime. I'd love to hang something like this in my kitchen window. I think it would really be beautiful. I'm hoping somewhere somebody will offer this on Etsy sometime and I can get my own little stained glass window with the Wild Honey cover. Also on Wild Honey, Joel Goldenberg pointed out that it appears that Brian reused part of the melody at the end of a thing or two for part of Do It Again. I can certainly hear that now that I listen to it. I'd never thought of it before. Thanks for that observation, Joel. On episode 70, 90's Odd Tracks Part 2, the old outlaw clued me into a German CD single release of Brian Wilson's version of Do It Again from the I Just Wasn't Made For These Times soundtrack album. I was able to score a copy of the single through Discogs. It's a three-track single. In addition to Do It Again, you get Brian's version of Till I Die also from the album and the Wilson Paley track This Song Wants to Sleep With You Tonight. I knew the song from Boots of the Wilson Paley sessions, but I didn't know it had ever been officially released anywhere. I was under the impression that the only track from the Wilson Paley sessions so far to have been officially released was the one that we discussed in My Moon Dreams from the Pulp Surfing Collection a track that Scott Kennedy in his comments memorably described as very cool cinematic spaghetti surf. Obviously, I stand corrected. There's a little enclosure in the single called Production Facts. I took two years of German in college, so let's see how I do here. It says basically that Brian Wilson was responsible for nearly two dozen Beach Boy Top 40 singles, including number one hits Get Around, Help Me Rhonda, und God Vibrations, and also produced 10 top 10 albums. He is presented in a Don Was produced documentary, I Just Wasn't Made For These Times, with an album of the same name. This is a preview of the new album with the U.S. Top 20 1968 hit, Do It Again, with his daughters, Carney and Wendy. Thanks so much for letting me know about this, Rick. I really appreciate it. Also on that episode, I was very pleased to know that I'm not the only one that hates these CD jewel cases and finds them annoying, aggravating, and hard to deal with. I really enjoyed reading everybody's tales of woe and commiserating about broken cases, torn booklets, and even wrecked CDs from the Jewel case. Sorry about your misery, but I'm glad to know that I'm not alone. On episode 71, Bruce and Terry, Dojo Tone Channel recommended Steve McParlin's written work, including Sound Waves and Traction, which devotes 44 pages to Bruce and Terry. I was only aware of McParlin's book, The Wilson Project, and I think I've been missing out. While the story this tells is not particularly pleasant, it's chock full of data, it's exhaustively researched, and it's the kind of thing I love to find. Apparently, McParlin has also written or co-written a number of great sounding titles about early and mid-60s surf, pop, and drag culture. Unfortunately, they all seem to be out of print and are either unavailable or commanding astonishing prices secondhand. Luckily, Dojo Tone Channel pointed out that a lot of these are available for download as ebooks through McParlin's C Music website. Dojo Tone Channel has a really great channel here on YouTube that features a lot of 60s surf and hot rod, as well as deep dives into late 60s and early 70s favorites, Bread and the Association. It's a really a labor of love and some unique and enjoyable viewing. You should check that out. 
In episode 72, U.S. Pop Culture 1985 Part 1, I said that Brian Wilson had, in the spring of 1985, shaved off the beard that he'd had pretty much since 1971 or 2. Obviously, I was wrong about that. You can see that he's beardless in 1973 on the back of the Holland album, and Robert Zastro points out that the beard didn't really become a fixture until like 75 or 76. Also, Robert says there's footage of Brian at the Nebworth concert in 1980, where he's only got like a three or four day stubble, so apparently he shaved it off at least for a short time in 1980. Joel Goldenberg provided a link to some footage of clips of Brian in 72 and 74. The 72 clip, of course, he's clean shaven. In 74, there's a little bit of beard. Looks like the beard didn't really become a fixture until late 74, around the time of the Caribou Sessions, or 1975, somewhere in that window, much later than the 71, 72, I was thinking. Sorry about that. Thanks, Robert and Joel, for catching me, and it was quite interesting to talk about, actually. Also, Ian Lee asked, if the documentary Beach Boys, an American Band, which was released in 1985, is shorter on DVD than it was on the original VHS release. I watch that VHS release a lot. I feel like I practically have it memorized. I didn't notice anything missing on the DVD version. If anybody has any information that there's a shorter edit of that documentary and what's missing, I'd really appreciate it if you'd let me know. I think it's all there, but, you know, something could be missing. I just wouldn't see it. Also on that episode, I really enjoyed Scott Kennedy's comments about how he became a Beach Boy fan in the 90s. I've heard from a lot of other people who became Beach Boy fans in the 90s, and I always kind of wondered how that worked. I mean, they obviously weren't at their best in the 90s and really didn't have a very high profile. In Scott's case, it was those CD reissues, the twofers that Capitol put out, and the Good Vibrations box set, which totally makes sense to me. I mean, what a great way to be introduced to the Beach Boys through those releases. I'd like to hear from other people who got into the Beach Boys in the 90s. How did you do it? I know usual Mike Television got into the Beach Boys in the 90s. I don't recall. I don't think you've told me how you did that. Love to hear actually from anybody in any period. How did you get into the Beach Boys? It's always an interesting story. Thanks also to everybody who commented about the format that I used for the 1985 pop culture videos. Based on the response, I think I am going to go ahead and do a part three covering September through December roughly, sometime in August. So thanks for the feedback and comments on that. Much appreciated. Don't have time to get into all the great comments that I've got, but I would like to sort of thank a few people. John Savala, of course, KLCS Weber, Leopoldo Petriesca, B. South, Chris Rainbow, D. Michael Elkins, Dino Molino, Johnny G, Adams85, Ibram with his great channel, of course, Martin Steele, Brian Kruger, Frank Allison, my parents. Thanks so much for everything. Thanks for the feedback. It's that input from you guys that really makes this worth doing. It's really, this is a labor of love. I really am having such a great time doing this. And I've learned so much cool stuff about the Beach Boys. Thanks very much. You guys really make it worthwhile, and I really appreciate it. We'll see you next week. Bye.